Welcome to Inside EcoDevo, a podcast giving you an inside look into the Missouri Department of Economic Development, where you'll hear directly from our team members and partners working on exciting initiatives that are helping Missourians prosper. Recently, the Missouri Department of Economic Development embarked on its ARPA Helping Missourians Prosper Tour. It was a 12-stop statewide celebration highlighting DED's nine ARPA grant programs, which represented a total of more than $500 million awarded and took place across each of Missouri's six regions, both urban and rural. A total of nearly 1,700 miles were driven by Team DED during that six-day tour. So on this episode, we're going to bring you some highlights of that tour and showcase the impact of those federal dollars and the work of Team DED. Our journey this episode starts where the tour kicked off, on a farm in Clarence, Missouri, during a hot June 20th morning to celebrate over $43 million for a broadband infrastructure project that will service seven counties. So today we gather to celebrate a momentous occasion. That's Ryan Johnson, Chairman and CEO of Cheriton Valley. Missouri Broadband Infrastructure Grant Program funds are being transformed into life-enhancing services through a Cheriton Valley broadband project. Today is not just about the physical infrastructure you drove by on the road. It's about the countless opportunities it will unlock for businesses, entrepreneurs, students, and families. With this fiber network, we are sowing the seeds of progress that will yield a future ripe of possibilities. Ryan mentions the physical infrastructure happening in the area. We drove past workers and machines along this dusty gravel road, surrounded by farmland on our way to our destination. These machines were shaking the very ground as they were punching fiber cable into that ground almost like a sewing machine does thread through cloth. It was quite impressive to observe. We're very excited to be here celebrating Sheridan Valley. That's B.J. Tanksley, Director of the Office of Broadband Development within the department. And the awards that they received, uh, $43 million in awards for 10 different projects. That's just fantastic. It really is. I mean, you can't talk about how big of an impact that's going to have across the state. Ten different project areas really expanding on the awesome work that's already been done in the past already. So, and excited for where this can lay for the future, too. And really bringing connections to people that are some of the hardest to reach across the state. You know, when we had that huge investment to make, it was easy to talk about, hey, this is a big investment. And then we talked about guidelines. And then as the broadband director, I was like, Was anybody even going to apply? You don't ever know, right? And so when we closed applications, we had over 300 applications for broadband grants asking for over six times what we had in funding. And then when the time came and they brought the projects to me, I was thrilled to see projects like this, where you have a lot of local investment going to this. It's not just us and it's not just you all, but also having local governments putting some of their own ARPA funds into some of these projects. That's really exciting for the Office of Broadband, knowing that we are supporting projects that the locals also support. Next, we heard from Representative Lewis Riggs. We had no idea seven years ago that we would be looking at a fiber install on a gravel road in Shelby County ever, ever. To us, that was like the dark side of the moon, but but here it is today. So my goal before I turn out here in 26 is to speak of broadband internet in the past tense. As if to underscore the need for reliable internet service in that area, we tried to live stream this event, but we failed due to lack of cell service in the area. And all the while, those machines were punching that fiber cable as they worked their way down the road. The irony of that was not lost on us. On that same day, June 20th, Team DED traveled to Northwest Missouri State University to celebrate a nearly $1 million workforce development grant. We met in the workshop area of the McKinley building there on campus. The room was filled with toolboxes and power connections hanging from the ceiling. In the workforce grant, we had 138 applications in that program. We're hearing from former director of federal initiative, Shad Burner. We had $30 million available, 138 applications for way more than the money we had available, and we were only able to make 19 awards. And so this is one of those awards. So it's a pretty exciting opportunity for Northwest Missouri State to have one of those awards today. And I would say that this one stood out because of the relationship the university has built with Kawasaki in particular, but with the private sector. 
because that's where we have to go as a state. When we think about workforce development in the future, this can't happen in isolation with the university and it can't happen in isolation with the private sector, but it has to happen together. We also heard from Tim Melvin, human resources manager with Kawasaki. He spoke about the partnership between Northwest Missouri State University and Kawasaki to help bring technology professionals to the job market. This partnership is centered around the technology laboratory opening at the university using the workforce development grant. We found today's job market is not always conducive to an influx of those kind of technology professionals, and we have really struggled um, in the past to fulfill those positions. Today, we celebrate the McKinley Building and the Northwest Missouri State University Workforce Project. Tomorrow, we anticipate to celebrate this partnership with highly trained individuals ready to conquer projects with their advanced technology skills. This facility gives us the opportunity, and that's what I think facilities do. We're hearing Dr. Rod Barr, director of the School of Agricultural Sciences at Northwest Missouri State University. I think they give us opportunities, and this is one that I'm really excited to see. We've got, it's, it's interesting as we bring, bring people that have been in this facility to see what it was after the university transitioned out of it, it out of an agricultural mechanics laboratory into a variety of different things and walk into it today. But our objective is to provide educational opportunities to prepare tomorrow's workforce. And this facility is one that will allow us to do it in this ever-changing world. And there's, there's little doubt in my mind that this facility is gonna help us to accomplish that goal and really make an impact in our region for our industry. The very next day, June 21st, Team DED hit the road for our next stop, which was in Kansas City, Missouri, to break ground on the KCI 29 Logistics Park, a development that will create 20 million square feet of Class A industrial buildings and create 9,000 direct jobs using $40 million in industrial site development grant funding. The event site was nothing more than an empty field with a giant tent where about 50 to 70 people gathered off in the distance, we could see heavy machinery moving earth, preparing the site for the buildings that would eventually be built. Earlier this month, we announced $40 million in state funding. We're hearing Governor Michael Parson, 57th governor of Missouri. Through our industrial site development grant program to Port KC to support the construction and infrastructure of this site, including more than two miles of sanitary sewer, more than one mile of public water main extensions, one and a half miles of public streets and storm sewer, and 1.5 additional miles of electrical distribution system. So congratulations on $40 million. The KCI 29 Logistic Park Project embodies how state government, local government, and businesses can work together to create improvements for all through the states, the economy, freight movement, and more. And we are looking forward to bringing $2.5 billion in capital investment and 9,000 new jobs to the area with these projects. But here's the bottom line. A little over five years ago when I became governor, I said the priorities of this state to me was gonna be workforce development infrastructure. I have not veered from that one time. You can make a lot of things priorities as being a governor or mayor, but if you don't make something a priority, nothing's a priority. And we are now seeing the benefits of that vision over five years ago when you see projects like this. When I go overseas and try to recruit businesses that are here in the United States, you just can't go out there and say, yeah, we're, we're a great state. We want you to come here and you're going to like us. People want to know in the business arena, what are you doing for site selections? What are you doing for infrastructure improvements? I have been now overseas. I've been here in the United States. These type of site selections are the future if you're going to bring businesses here. Last year in the state of Missouri, now listen to me, last year in the state of Missouri, 83,000 new jobs. I'm not talking replacement jobs. I'm talking about new jobs. $2.7 billion in new investment, new companies, new business in our state. And that's not even counting this site yet. We're having people look at our state where we used to think $100 million was a big investment. And I still do think $100 million is a big investment. I think $1 million is a big investment. Heck, I even think $100,000 a lot. But here's what I'll tell you. We now have things that we're discussing with people in the billion-dollar categories that we've never had in the state of Missouri. And I'm not talking about just one. I'm talking about multiple conversations we're having right now with people about coming to Missouri 
These are good for everyday Missourians, every good day people. That's why I'm so excited to be part of this today. And I do believe many of you in this room are going to see the future right in front of you, and it's going to develop right here in Kansas City, Missouri. The project we celebrate today represents a major investment in Missouri's statewide competitiveness. That's DED's acting director, Michelle Hathaway. This $40 million investment in the Hunt Midwest Megasite project and the deployment of $75 million through the industrial site development grant as a whole sends the message to businesses across the United States and the world that Missouri is committed to industrial site development. This is a project that will be transformative for this region and for this city. That's Mayor Quentin Lucas of Kansas City. As we talked about logistics and supply chain challenges in years past, we see that a project like this one gets to be a strong answer, not just for Missouri, but for our entire country. And we're making Kansas City the heart of America, not just by geography, not just by what we say, but by the development opportunities we have here as well. Thousands of jobs, billions of dollars of economic development, and as the governor says, we're not done yet. June 21st wrapped up with a stop in Independence, Missouri to Mother's Refuge, which will provide transitional housing to ensure homeless young moms receive the housing and resources needed to transition to self-sufficiency. This will use over $1.4 million in community revitalization grant funding. The location was a former hotel that will be transformed into housing. Fountain Garden next to the building was our destination. Mother's Refuge was started in 1987 by a group of concerned citizens. We're hearing Angel McDonald, Executive Director at Mother's Refuge. That saw a need in the community for young pregnant moms that just had nowhere to go. And so they all came together and was able to secure a home on Delridge and Independence. We've seen over 2,000 moms and babies over the years that lives have been changed. It's a blessing to watch the moms come and transform their lives. And one of the things that we've seen through the years is the moms would come and they can stay up to two years after their baby's born, but in about a year, they're ready to get out and to try life on their own, but they don't have a lot of options. So they were going out into the communities that they came from and the situations that they came from, and they were going backwards, not forwards, like we want, you know, like we want our own kids. And they didn't have that support system. So we got together and we started trying to figure out how can we solve this problem? And we came up with, well, let's provide housing for them to move into, you know, so that they can still receive the support system that they need in a safe environment while they are learning how to parent. And it's just the beginning. I know that it's just the beginning because there's such a huge need in our community that we're not going to stop here, but this is a great first, well, second step really, because the first one was our home that we'll still have for girls under 18. This will be girls over 18 that can come here and, and have their own apartment. We're in an adventure. That's Kelsey Green, Assistant Executive Director at Mother's Refuge. That's what I'll call it, of a capital campaign. So to do all of this and sustain our programming, we have a $15 million goal. And this funding that we receive from ARPA is $1.49 million of that. So it is substantial in helping us be able to do the renovations. Yeah, that's worth clapping for. To be able to do the renovations that we need to do inside of this building. It was a 30-room boutique hotel. It was operating up until we bought it in December. Um, so they kept it in great shape, which you'll see. Um, and we are transitioning it into 12 individual apartments. We're moving our admin offices over here as well. We have a group space for our aftercare program in the basement. It's the amount of moms that we'll be able to help. I can't even tell you guys how many crisis calls come in every day of moms in our community who are needing help, who are needing shelter. And so this building is really going to revitalize our community to break those cycles. Moms can stay here for up to three years after they come into the program. So if they're at our shelter for a while, they come here. I mean, the first five years of a baby's life could be covered. And what we know about breaking a lot of those cycles of poverty and abuse is that that's what's really needed. And so if we can do that while moms are here and send those kiddos on a totally different path, like that's where we want to be. And that's the call we want to answer. 
I first heard about Mother's Refuge in 2010 when I was pregnant with my first daughter. We're hearing from Davida, a local mother who has received assistance from Mother's Refuge. I was able to stay at Mother's Refuge with the help while I was deciding if I was going to keep my daughter or give her up for adoption. They helped me with food, clothing, therapy, parenting classes, and ultimately, with the, with the help of the staff, I decided to give my daughter up for adoption. Mother's Refuge really helped me get through a rough time in my life when no one else, when no one else was there to help me. In 2021, I reconnected with the aftercare coordinator, Jesse. She told me that they were piloting a TLP program with the assistance of our director, Ms. Angel. She told me Angel thought I would be a great fit. I moved into my home, the Scary House, in August of 2022. They provided me and my children with all the home necessities that we needed. The only thing we brought were just our clothes. It was a fresh start that I needed. Since I have been living in the Scary House, I have been getting assistance with parenting classes. I've started therapy. I've started working on my credit. I will soon start seeing a financial advisor to start the process of home ownership. I'm really happy that I found Mother's Refuge when I did 13 years ago. They have been there for me all this time, and I'm sure they will be there for me in the future. June 22nd saw Team DED in Rolla, Missouri at the Ozark Actors Theater to celebrate a local tourism asset development grant project of over $1.3 million. These funds will help renovate a dilapidated property to support existing downtown events, enable new events, house visiting performing artists, and stimulate further investment in economic activity in Rolla's downtown. It has been, for the whole world, a roller coaster, but here's our story. Ozark Actors Theater board member, Kevin Edwards. During the pandemic, Ozark Actors Theater, OAT, went 18 months between full-length productions. And that's a disaster for a small professional theater regardless, but it caught out at a particularly vulnerable point within the largest capital campaign in our 36-year history. We finished a playhouse renovation just in time for the 2019 summer season and staged five professional and three community productions in the second half of, of 2019. Then, March of 2020 happened. So in, in a community our size, uh, we need every possible donor contributing to pull off a major capital campaign. This little town of 20,000, we don't have a metro area to draw from, so we really have to pull everyone together. Yet suddenly, all of our supporters in the entertainment, hospitality, and restaurant industries were fighting for their own financial lives. The capital campaign came kind of to a screeching halt. So we had land for the studio, but no cash to build it with. We had tax credits that were going to expire and no way to liquidate them. Our scenic inventory was literally in a borrowed barn about 15 miles north of Rolla up in Marys County. Uh, debts were mounting and life looked pretty bleak. So today I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank the Missouri Department of Economic Development for the response to that in our case. The DED first extended our tax credits by a full year, giving us time to find another path forward. And then they worked with us to structure the acquisition of this building in exchange for most of our remaining tax credits, which solved both of those problems. Which brings us to this building and this street. Pine Street, north of the tracks, um, has been the heart of Rolla's downtown for over 100 years when it terminated at a horse watering fountain about a half a block from here. It was part of historic Route 66, and it's still Rolla's primary parade route. And what better location to invest in? As you all entered the building, you noticed the empty storefronts all around us. This end of Pine Street needs an economic anchor. And through this project, the Pine Street Studio will become exactly that. The heart of community is in the downtown district. We're hearing once again from former director of federal initiatives, Shad Burner. And so when I pulled in here today and I saw the opportunity of what a $1.3 million investment would do in downtown Rolla, uh, it got me really excited because uh, I I think it can be a catalyst and there can be so much more that happens in downtown Rolla. And obviously you have the community and the passion to make it happen. That's why we got really excited about this project, not because you're going to redo some HVAC or you're going to redo some plumbing or you have critical electrical needs. 
All those things are important. They have to happen. They're on the checklist. But the why is the community revitalization and drawing people to downtown Rolla to help our communities thrive. And that's what it's all about. This is going to be such an asset for downtown. That's Lana Sowers, president of the Rolla Downtown Business Association. Especially this end of downtown, which has been one of our concerns for a while. If you don't have a strong downtown, the entire community suffers. And our downtown, like all, is that just the heart of your community. I am so excited that this is going to bring economic development. It's going to bring more community revitalization. This is huge. We appreciate it. We're a resilient community, but sometimes we need some dollars. So thank you. We ended the day of June 22nd in Columbia, Missouri at the Orr Street Park. At the moment, it's nothing more than a gravel-filled lot. But this $1.25 million community revitalization grant project will transform it into a multi-generational park of wide open green space, a playground, performance area, and many other features. This grant will help revitalize this area, which is in such a cool part of town. Again, that's former director of federal initiatives, Shad Burner. What a great part of town. And then to have this huge gravel lot with nothing in it in the middle of it that will soon be something incredible is just phenomenal. For more than a hundred years, this was the site of an Ameren manufactured gas plant. Ameren completed remediation on this in 2021 and the city purchased this site in 2022. And they did it to create a community park in the North Village Arts District. This will include open green space, playgrounds, performance areas, outdoor art areas, seating areas, walking trails. Such a great addition to this vibrant downtown area. This has been something that we've been working on for years. That's Columbia Mayor Barbara Buffalo. This site, I remember talking about when there used to be the structure still up here, the idea about what are we going to do with this. Part of that when we first had the first right of first refusal for the sale of this with the city of Columbia. And then every year since, kind of reinvigorating the interest of this because we knew how important it was to not just Columbia and downtown Columbia, but North Village Arts District, as we've seen new renovations happening within the first ward all around us that creates that culture of vibrancy that is Columbia. And this is just gonna help highlight that. This wraps up part one of our ARPA journey from expanding broadband and workforce development in Missouri's rural North region to breaking ground on a mega site and helping moms in need in the Kansas City region, to helping restore a historic downtown building and adding a park to another in the central region. Nearly 750 miles, six stops in three different Missouri regions across three days. But this is just the beginning. So stay tuned for part two of our ARPA tour recap, where we continue our trek across Missouri spotlighting businesses, organizations, and communities who are helping to fulfill our motto of helping Missourians prosper.